A.R. Hayes, and the Aspen, a convict's thought. So, today, mainstream media gets a big F.U. in the Brian Koberger case. Isn't it well-deserved? I don't even think I need to take a lot of time in discussing this and how I feel. When it first came out, it hit me like a ton of mix. I was thinking, the judge is going to broadcast the trial via YouTube channel. Hmm. I could only imagine how many views he would get from that. And let me tell you, he'd make a lot of money. Lots and lots of money. But, thankfully, that's not the case. He can't make money. I mean, it's obviously not in the realm of the way things work. However, what it does do is it does give him control, which is much needed in the Idaho 4 case, of the camera work, as well as all the garbage that's put on the TV screen for all the viewers to see. It's garbage. News Nation, Court TV, they've all found Brian Koberger guilty and they're posting unverified evidence on the side bar of every time they're filming in the courtroom. He stalked the girls. He had pictures on the Instagram on his phone. This is all unconfirmed. And this is the mainstream media that today's society relies on to get our news that's happening not only in our country, but the world. When are people going to realize they're full of it? They have been forever, forever and ever and ever. But now it's just starting to smack people in the face because every time we see a broadcast, <clears throat> it is so one-sided towards guilt that nobody within the mainstream media could give any defendant a chance of possibly being innocent and beating their case in trial. Does anybody feel that there's one mainstream media source that thinks Koberger has a chance? Come on. You know News Nation doesn't. Look at Banfield and the ex-FBI broad that she, she couldn't investigate a case if it was life or death for the entire country. She couldn't find a piece of evidence and figure something out on her own. How she ever became a part of the Bureau who knows, but it's pure sign of how well-educated and well-trained our Bureau is. Is that who you trust to solve cases nowadays? Would you put Koffendoffer as one of the lead FBI agents in charge of the Brian Koberger investigation there in Moscow? Because look at how badly, just from her seat perched in the newsroom, She's talked in regards to evidence of this case. All she's ever talked about is unconfirmed evidence as pure truth and never one time actually discussed what it's like to investigate, to prove something as real or not real. She couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. Hence why she no longer is a part of the FBI. You know, I almost feel bad for Brian Eaton Enton, excuse me, because he seems like a genuinely nice guy. He sits down and he seems to care when he's doing the interviews of the victims' families. He seems as though he's inter interested in actually talking about the crime scene and what possibly could have happened. He covered this from beginning until now, and he seems like a legitimately nice guy. Can I say he's given proper info on the case? Probably to the best of what he knows. He's paid by News Nation and the mainstream media to put out information. So that's what he does. Whether it's correct or not, who knows. 
I think it's a good thing, actually. After scratching my head at first and wondering how bad it could possibly be to have a trial broadcast on YouTube, I started actually listening to others and doing some due diligence research, and I do come to the conclusion it is working in other cases. It does actually give the court the control of the video cameras, which I think is important. Now, what frustrates me, and I really got to dig into it, is some of the content creators, there's one in particular that just always seems to side with, well, the defense gets another win, they get another win, they get another win. You baffoon fool. It's not just the defense that asked for no cameras in the courtroom. Why is everybody claiming this was the defendant jumping up and down screaming for no cameras in the courtroom? It was not just him. The prosecution was 100% on board with it. 100% okay with no cameras in the courtroom. Everybody wants this case to be hush-hush got to be behind the scenes. It's got to be sealed, redacted. Come on, we're, we're watching it unfold firsthand at how hidden everything within this case is. But I'm also watching that it's always the defendant got to win because the IgG results need to be turned over. Why is that a win? That's called discoverable evidence. And for anybody that follows the narrative of the prosecution that the IgG did not play an instrumental part in any of the warrants for the arrest, come on now. Come on now, really? You know, we're, we're doing a series on the channel uh, about common sense. Common sense. I know people that subscribe to my channel and they watch and they discuss this case with me. I know you have common sense. I know you do. Because you're seeing even the people that feel as though Brian Koberger is guilty. I have respect for you because when you engage in conversation with me, you can make your points, but you also understand there's some issues. You even have some questions. So I know many out there that want justice for the Idaho Four, Kaylee, Zanna, Ethan, and Maddie. Even though you want justice, you understand there's issues within this case. And one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest issues there is, is that DNA on that sheath. And I'm not talking about it being planted. I'm not talking about the DNA being somehow put on that sheath by anybody other than maybe the defendant himself. Okay, we don't need to get into that discussion right now, even though it's a big, wide open scope. It's a big discussion. I mean, that's one that needs to be had as well. But let's just really look at the way the case was investigated. And it all points to IgG testing and a backdoor usage of a fruit of the poisonous tree system they got them their arrest warrant. And what's really scary about it is this judge that's in charge of the case right now can look through the documents and he ought to be able to look back at the arrest warrants that were issued with the judge that preceded him and see what was presented to her to issue said arrest warrant. I feel like there's something a little bit shady going on, like this judge is willing to cover for the last judge in the sense that maybe she didn't fully understand how the DNA was connected back to this suspect before she issued that arrest warrant. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it makes far more sense 
that the IgG results came back via the DNA on the sheet far before anybody went to Pennsylvania and took any trash out of the trash can, Russ processed it, and somehow started putting together a family tree. And I know many out there are going to give me the whole schematics of how they put it all together, and that's great. Look, I, I'm intelligent, but I'm not the smartest person in the world, okay? I, I don't... I don't know every step of the book, but I know when I do my research and I talk with people and I listen to some very highly educated people within law state that it most likely was falsely gathered information that led to this arrest. That leads me back to one thing, and that, that one thing is the only thing possible that could have secured this type of arrest warrant for this big of a crime all the way across the country, and it comes back to DNA. It comes back to DNA. Ladies and gentlemen, I've had a lot of arrest warrants issued for me in my life, <laughs> and trust me, I'm not proud of it. But I do understand the concept of what it takes to get an arrest warrant, especially in larger scale type crimes. You're not going to get it on phone pings. You won't get an arrest warrant based off of phone pings. You will not get an arrest warrant based off of a car driving around for an hour in the neighborhood. You better have more. And when we look at the probable cause affidavit, and this is what's written to get yourself an arrest warrant, this is the document that is given to a judge to get an arrest warrant. For those out there that are smarter than me will say that they go before the judge, they have a discussion, they give them their argument, and they, you know, they file for the arrest warrant. And the judge has to feel as though there's substantial evidence to move forward to issue that arrest warrant. It doesn't mean they have to find the defendant guilty. They got to find an array of evidence that makes sense that this person could be the possible cul culprit of the actual crime because we haven't gone to preliminary hearing and we haven't had a grand jury indictment at that point. So this judge, all they're settling at this point is whether or not there's enough to pursue an arrest warrant. They didn't catch the person red-handed, which here's one of my biggest debates. And I had this one with a lawyer the other day. We were going back and forth about it because in my mind, to get that arrest warrant, you got to have some substantial ability to put someone at that scene with the scenario of committing the crime to get the arrest warrant. And I proceeded in my debate with if they had video footage of this defendant at the scene, either in his car or getting out of his car, approaching the home at the said time of the crime within minutes, would that be substantial enough to get an arrest warrant? Absolutely. Done deal. Because it puts him at the crime scene. However, if you don't have that video footage, and let me tell you, there's a lot of YouTube creators. And I, I had someone come at me today because I don't get on here with you guys every day and go through all the videos and dissect them. And I don't put up all the cool imagery up on the screen for you guys to see so we can talk about it and go through it. I think every other YouTube content creator that you're watching, because I'm not the only one, but those of you that are watching others, that's great. And they get to dissect those things for you. And you've seen them all. And none of you have seen this defendant at the crime scene getting in or out of his car. Nowhere in the PCA does it state this defendant is seen exiting his car heading to the crime scene home. Nowhere. Because that would have sealed the deal. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that would have been all they needed for an arrest warrant. That would have been it. They wouldn't have had to talk about the cell phone pings. They wouldn't have had to give up their eyewitness that saw bushy eyebrows walking through the living room of their home in the dark and all black and a face mask but no knife and not in a hurry and didn't, you know, it was scary enough to put her in frozen shock face. You know, I mean, I get it. You don't have to call 911 for eight hours because you're texting your buddies and then you're going to call your friends over in the morning. So it'll be okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. Everything will be handled eight hours from now. Don't worry. But ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't need that eyewitness account. You wouldn't have to throw her under the bus. You wouldn't need the cell phone pings. You can mention the car and the path that it was taking, and then all you have to say at that point, it's a plain and simple statement. We watched the defendant get out of his car and walk towards and into the home of the crime scene at said time. And next thing you know, we have four lost lives. Boom, it's a sealed deal. You got your warrant. You got it. Now we're not fighting over the IgG because if you're not going to introduce it at trial anyway, you wouldn't want to put it in the PCA if you didn't have to. You wouldn't want to put it in there. When I discussed it with said lawyer, who's much smarter than me, but I like to just run scenarios because you got to realize... I was a criminal that could look back and say, well, I remember doing this at a crime scene. I remember this. I remember that. I remember, oh, this is what got me caught. This is what got me off. This is, okay, cool. And I, you know, I was fathoming back and forth. Like, if you had more DNA at the scene that the prosecution was able to gather that tied to the defendant, would they even need the sheath? Would they even need the sheath? Because now they have overwhelming DNA evidence. But it still comes back to what was tested, how was it tested to get the arrest warrant that allowed you to arrest the defendant and bring him in to take a mouth swab? Okay. I got to slow that down because many have not been through the process of being arrested. They take the mouth swab two different ways. One being when you get arrested and you are charged with a felony crime, they can get a warrant through the court to secure your DNA mouth swab or however they get your DNA. I, you know, in DUIs, they take blood, they take different things. Okay, and now they could analyze that against the said evidence. The second way that they can get it is for you to agree to give it to them. If you say, hey, I'm, I don't have any knowledge of this crime, I'm more than happy to give you my DNA swab, then you can give it. We have been told this whole big story of trash in a trash can that was flown back and all this analysis that was done by the FBI. Let's just admit it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's admit it through the common sense. If we just look at it with common sense, they went through a back door of a, gen a genetic genealogy company they weren't supposed to use. They got the results. The FBI called in a tip. This is called the informant. They called in a tip because, look, the FBI is not going to testify. It's an informant. They called the tip in. Now, the FBI was expecting the state police and the local Moscow police to not jump the gun and make the arrest based off of that information. They were supposed to work the case and investigate it. Instead, they jumped the gun and they utilized this. And now the prosecution is left in a bad situation of trying to piece together this DNA scenario by 
withholding the IgG. They have fought this, ladies and gentlemen, for months upon months, and this entire fight is the reason why the speedy trial got waived. If you don't think this is going to the appeal court the minute a verdict is made in this case, if a guilty verdict is found in this case, it's an immediate appeal, and it's going to be a battle. And there's a good chance this defendant would win that appeal. But right now, we're waiting because here we are in one of the weirdest situations ever. We've already had actual experts in the field testify in the hearing. The prosecution's already made the statements. They don't even want to cross-examine them because I think they're going to be baffled by anything and all answers. And they're going to get ran through the dirt because those experts already know what happened. Well, that's why FBI showed up at experts' home. The prosecution is reeling, trying to wail their hands out, saying, we're not even using it at trial, ladies and gentlemen. We're not using it. This isn't how we secured our warrant. What did you secure your warrant based on then? Because we've all read this PCA. We've all read it. And those that have already found this guy guilty, good for you. But if you really reel in the common sense, you know it's clicking in the back of your mind going, it's not real strong. It's not real strong. And we kind of know how they got their warrant to arrest him and fly him all the way back across the country. And that's how they got the DNA swab, which if it's found this is the fruit of the poisonous tree, and this is how they actually confirmed his DNA and got that arrest warrant. That DNA swab should be thrown completely out. I've seen it a lot in court cases. It wouldn't be the first time DNA gets excluded out of a case. And I, in the back of my mind, in the conversations I've had, we've all kind of come to the agreement that DNA's got to go. And if you don't have substantial, powerful evidence that can overcome no DNA in this case, you might have to just dismiss the charges against this young man until you can find something more substantial. And we'll talk more because, as you know, I've got my oddity in this case series that's going to go into part two here very, very soon. But I wanted to get on here and I wanted to explain it's actually a good thing. The court now has control of the actual mainstream media's cameras being kept out of the courtroom and the courts are going to handle all the filming. This is going to negate all the propaganda and the crap that's put on that screen that just continuously feeds people's minds that this guy is guilty. No jury has found him guilty, ladies and gentlemen. He hadn't been to trial yet. Yet mainstream media sure made him a convicted felon already on death row. Common sense, ladies and gentlemen. Common sense. What evidence have you seen? What evidence have you seen outside of the DNA on the sheath that most likely was fruit of the poisonous tree tested to get to the point we're at today. And that's called an arrest warrant. Would this defendant be sitting in jail right now? Would he be in jail for over a year on a quadruple homicide death penalty case? without the IgG analysis helping to get an arrest warrant. Is it possible? I don't think so, unless he was dumb enough to give his own DNA. Do you feel as though Brian Koberger gave his own DNA to the, to the law enforcement? Do you, do you think so? Do you think he voluntarily gave his DNA because from what we understand what transpired in Pennsylvania is they dug trash out of a neighbor's garbage can it's not on camera 
course, there's no body cam footage of that. They, they did not show how they got that either. But it didn't even come back to him. It came back to his father. It was his parents' trash. You gotta shake my head a little bit, ladies and gentlemen. If you really feel as though the DNA was correctly gathered and the arrest warrant was not based off of the sheath DNA, please leave me a comment. Clue me in. Send me an email at a convict's thoughts. I'm open ears. I want to hear all about it. But I'm telling you my gut feeling because I know how law enforcement works behind closed doors because I've been there. I've been through the ringer, ladies and gentlemen. I've watched them firsthand take some crazy little steps in either getting a person like myself to tell on ourselves or give up evidence that we didn't necessarily have to give up to. I gave up a DNA sample once very early in life that thankfully got thrown out in court because they misled me to get it. Could that have happened here as well? Or did they use the fruit of the poisonous tree? It's a head scratcher, right? But I know you have the common sense. I know you have it. And that's why we don't need mainstream media covering this case in the courtroom because we're all smart enough we don't need their coverage. We don't need to hear what they have to say because they have nothing valid to say. There's nothing real about their conversation. Nothing. And it hasn't been since day one. Since this man was arrested, they've already put him on death row. Go back. Watch all the news nation you want. Watch all the court TV you want. You're not going to get one bit of valid, actual discussion in regards to evidence, knowledge of the suspect and the victims, none of it's right, none of it's real, none of it's confirmed. It's called news, bogus news. And I'm sitting here and I'm sitting with Aspen and I'm excited that they got the boot from the courtroom. Right on. Judge, Judge, you handle that now. Moving forward, we all put our faith in you to hold a fair trial. Give this man the right to defend himself in a fair trial. I'm A.R. Hayes. This is my little rant, a convict's thoughts. Appreciate you joining me. Oddities in the Idaho 4, continuing... Part 2 coming soon. Watch for it.